Good afternoon, I'm graduating senior Erin Winters and I'm delighted to welcome you to a conversation with Howard University President Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick. This is the third installment in a series of webcasts that will take place periodically throughout the year. Today's discussion will focus on Dr. Frederick's vision for strengthening the university. The discussion can be seen live on howard.edu, whur.com, and whut.org. We already have quite a few questions for you, Dr. Frederick, submitted through social media, but first let me start with one of my own. What are the top three goals for the university in 2016? Sure. Well, before I answer that, let me first say, Ms. Winters, thanks for doing this. And uh, we certainly are proud of you. And having a student um, interview me says a lot about what Howard University is. In terms of the goals of the university for 2016, the first, I, I would say, is to make sure that we are providing academic excellence. And I will always be one of the top priorities for the university. We are in the business of educating young men and women, and we have to do that in an excellent fashion. So the support services that allow us to do that must be delivered in an excellent fashion and I would say that that's the second goal um, or sec second top priority. We have to make sure that our support services whether it's in residence life, financial aid, um, in the bursar's office, admissions, all of those services have to be done in such a way that it's customer friendly, it's easy for students to navigate the system and their parents and again um, enhances the entire experience here at the university, and that's certainly critical. And I would say the third is to make sure that um, fiscally uh, we are not just solvent but thriving. Uh, it's, it's extremely important. Higher education is under a lot of pressure uh, for several reasons, and certainly the students that we have selected to educate requires that we are fiscally nimble in terms of what we do, and so those would be the top three goals. Okay. <coughs> so the next question is, what was your greatest success in 2015 for the university? So, you know, I'm, I'm not one to look at successes. I'm, I'm trying to look at the problems and, and get beyond them. Um, so to be quite honest, when, when I look at the question of successes, I have to say that getting the team focused on, and the, the, the team focused on getting the university to operate as a community and to be engaged is really, uh, you know, the biggest thing that I'm concerned about. And I think that we've done that um, in some pockets. We haven't done it comprehensively, um, but that's something that I'm looking for. In other words, the, the successes aren't mine to own. The successes are really um, the broad opportunity. So our fiscal um, circumstance has improved significantly in terms of how we're performing. Again, I think that's been a community effort. So I really look, you know, on the, the community coming together to solve the university's issues ultimately as, as the broader success story. Yeah. Now in 2015, we, uh, Howard experienced a lot and we were in the media a lot with Homeless at Howard with, um, so this is just a follow up with Homeless at Howard with the band, um, just several different circumstances. How do you feel about the students um, coming, going to social media and talking about these things? Yeah, so, so the first thing is I, I'm a strong advocate for the students doing that. Um, I think you know students have to express themselves, yeah. um, especially w if they're dissatisfied, they have to do that. Um, I am more concerned about the digital footprint that that leaves, and so the tone and tenor of how that's done is appropriate. And I think using expletives or being um, really derogatory or pointing out one person or I, you know, in particular, um, outside of me, I, I certainly discourage that. I think we have to look at the problems and the solutions. The other thing is, you know, a university campus is here for discourse. You must have disagreement and discourse on a university campus. It's a tradition of what higher education um, has, and it actually is why higher education has been able to provide so many solutions to um, the nation's problems. So you need that discourse and dissent on, on a university campus. The tone and tenor of it, though, really determines the uh, ultimate outcome in terms of the character of it. It's very difficult in a tweet of 140 characters to solve any problem. Um, you may I examine the problem, um, but in 140 characters, it's, it's kind of difficult. We are bringing people to university campus for the purpose of dialogue. And while social media is an avenue, it provides instant gratification of releasing you know, your opinions about something that has occurred. But the ultimate 
um, goal should be first to find solutions. And that still requires a university campus to have critical thinking, to have some rationale for decision making, um, to have compromise, all of which you really get from a dialogue. Yeah. And so one of the things I encourage my team, and I certainly hope the, the university community as a whole would do, would be to have more conversations. So yesterday, for instance, we launched our first um, bison teaching bison experience where um, the, the head of our IT was able to talk to students directly about what his plans are, what the vision is, what the problems are, and how you fix those, and to get their feedback as well on those. You, you need that dialogue. That can take place on a social media platform. That's very true. Um, okay, so the next question is, why isn't Howard a member of the United Negro College Fund? It, that's a great question. You know, the United Negro College Fund, um, at the time of its, its inception, was actually fully supported um, by Howard University in its effort um, from its inception. Howard University receives a large federal appropriation, and so a decision was made yet many years ago that we should not be a member to allow the other historically black colleges and universities to benefit from the activities of the United Negro College Fund, which I think was not only the honorable thing to do, but the right thing to do. And that's uh, why we're not a member. We support all the activities, um, and, and in doing so, I think support the other historically black colleges and universities fully. But that's essentially the history of it. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering that. <coughs> so, okay, so next question. What is the value of auctioning off the TV station? What is the probability of us receiving $600 million from this auction? And will the money go to increase the endowment? Yeah, g great question. So uh, just to clarify a little bit, we're not auctioning the TV station. Okay. Um, the, the, the spectrum on which we broadcast is what is um, up for auction. And that involves a complicated process that's managed by the FCC mm -hmm. with a lot of rules and regulations around it. They have set an opening bidding price of about 461 million. It's set up as a reverse auction, which means that's the highest price we could potentially get. And in every round of the bidding, that price will actually drop. So th we're not gonna get 600 million. Let me just state <laughs> that up front. Okay. What happens in the event that we do participate, that's the first decision that needs to be made. And then if we do participate, we obviously would then have to accept um, some type of a figure. I don't know what that is, so again, that's another unknown. And then based on that, obviously, what we do with the proceeds would be the last unknown, which of, of, I don't have a crystal ball to look into that. But that's really the process that we're examining and so on. And why are we examining that process? Because it, it is an opportunity that's unusual. Um, it, it's potentially a, a once um, in, in my lifetime opportunity that comes about and therefore I think the, the fiscally prudent thing for us to do is to at least examine it as a possibility. And that's why I informed the university community that it's something that we would look at. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so okay. moving on. So the next question is, do you support W.E.B. Du Bois's conviction that HBCUs should spearhead the movement for universal university education? You know, the, the time in which that was said is still fairly relevant in terms of the context in which it was said. And I, and I think we have to make sure that we understand that um, very, very carefully. Higher education is extremely expensive um, for many reasons. And here at Howard University, I think we do a miraculous job of getting students in who otherwise would not afford a private education. You see, and that's the first principle. Most people do not realize that this is a private institution. And we charge half the tuition of the other private institutions in the city. So that's the first thing. However, we have up to six times the number of Pell Grant eligible students, which means we are taking students from the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum and educating them. As with every other industry and business in this country today, the finances of it is extremely important. And while I do support the accessibility for a higher education, I'm also not convinced that it is the only way to really prepare a workforce for an entire nation, or for that matter, for the globe. You, you have many different types of industries, many different types of skill sets, and I certainly am a product of a higher education. I have three um, Howard University degrees, I'm happy to say. Mm -hmm. 
But I'm not sure that everybody needs to have three Howard University degrees yeah. in order to be a participating member of our society in a productive fashion. So that universality of a higher education needs to be an, ac an accessibility question. Where do you want the access, the quality of that access, yeah. and how many people can you realistically get into that pipeline um, so that you have the right outcomes? <laughs> and I think if we look at that, then we, we are asking a better question. We undervalue teachers in this country. We want a public school education system between K through 12 that's, ca that can compete with anyone in the world, but yet still we don't pay our teachers or for that matter grant them the type of respect they had when I was in K through 12. Right. I mean, when I was in K through 12, my teachers were next to the priests in right. terms of you know, how you viewed them outside of your home. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so that type of reverence and respect for educators is something that we have to look at. The young men and women who teach here at Howard University um, are doing so at a price that's significantly below market. And I think they do an excellent job and deserve to be at market. But again, someone has to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And if you talk about the universal <laughs> education, then you have to think about who's going to pay for the facilities that are required, who will pay for the deferred maintenance, who will pay for the upgrades. Mm -hmm. And by the time you do that, you're talking about a very significant bill. So I think, yes, the, the principle of what um, he was speaking about at that time in the context is one that is one of those grand ideas, but we have to have some serious discussion in this country in order to get from that point right. um, to, to bring that to a reality. Hmm. Okay, so Shaky Dance asks, when will the theater arts department get scholarships for the students and money to be able to support the program's needs? I, I like Shaky Dance's um, <laughs> tag. Let me just so say the handle. That. <laughs> right, absolutely, I like the handle. <clears throat> the the arts program in general is one that you know I, I think is very very dear to the nation in particular. Um, by my ca you know ca calculations, I think almost every night um, on American television in a prime time spot from Monday to Friday you will find somebody from Howard University on there yeah, right that's now. that's true. I think we've had Lance Gross, we have Taraji, Taraji. Henson, yeah. we have um, Debbie Allen directing a show, we have Anthony Anderson, all yeah. people who have been, uh, who have graced these hallways. So our contribution, and that's just one medium of television, right? When you talk about Broadway, you, you start expanding it to the Felicia Rashad. I mean, right. you can't go anywhere in this country and have a meaningful discussion about the arts and not have Howard University somewhere in that discussion. So the legacy of it is clearly there. The, the current production of who is coming out and what they're doing is clearly there as well. Mm -hmm. I think we have to marry that <coughs> with content that we produce. So I think we have the talent, but we have to make sure we marry it. So what, I'm, what am I doing and what my vision is? I am looking to start an arts foundation to raise an endowment that will fund the arts program here at Howard University. Mm -hmm. The instruction is more of a one-on-one -on -one instruction. It's more expensive per student to educate that group of students, and therefore you do need that type of investment in order to make sure that you do it well. Yeah. But we must start producing content of our own, given this digital age, so that we can perpetuate that involvement. So I think an arts foundation that starts a, a, a significant endowment um, that puts the school on, on solid fiscal and independent ground is one aspect of it. But I would love to see us producing more content and therefore creating more revenue streams and also creating more dialogue in this country around what we think is important to put into that, into those different art forms so that it can, we can really tell the history but also tell the contemporary nature of the African diaspora experience. Yeah, and how long do you think that type of process would take? You know, like with everything else, I, I think having an arts foundation and an endowment of that size, it, it would take a couple of years for, for that type of fundraising at minimum. There's no doubt about it. But I've spoken to a lot of the principals involved, such as Jesse Norman, um, the opera singer that uh, who's a Howard alum. I've spoken to Debbie Allen and Felicia Rashad about participating. I've spoken to Eddie and Sylvia Brown, who uh, are alum um, who live in the Baltimore area and have really supported the arts. I've spoken to David Driscoll, um, who, who is a well-known African-American artist who was, you know, again, a Howard product. 
I've spoken to Tony Morrison about it. So there are lots yeah. of people who are interested. So I've already started the process of trying to recruit people for such an event here. And then, you know, once we get that going, I think the kinds of people who are involved, we need to bring people who are not as familiar with Howard, but can write the type of checks that would be meaningful. A and I think once we get that process um, fully formed and running, I think we do have a realistic chance to bring that to fruition. Yeah. This is kind of um, a little tangent of a question, but how do you juggle all of this stuff? Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's a lot. Um, universities are complex um, entities. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I was reading an article um, <laughs> that was written, it was in the University Business um, uh, Magazine, it was talking about the college presidency is an impossible job. And sometimes <laughs> it is because people expect you to be an academic, they expect you to uh, be a good manager, they expect you to be fiscally responsible, yeah. um, they expect you to be a politician, they expect you to be uh, providing the best of customer service, and, and it is difficult um, at times. but. There is no job um, like the job of being here at Howard University. That's how I felt um, when I was here as a student. It's how I, f I have felt as an alum when I was away from here. And it certainly is how I felt when I was a faculty member. Um, I, you know, getting to teach here, I, I used to say all the time when I was a faculty member, if I could do this for free and take care of my family, I would do it for free. That, that's the extent of the love. And I think of all the difficulties with being a university president, or college president anywhere in the country, um, I, I tell all the college and university presidents I meet, this is a difficult job, but if you do it at Howard University, it's the best job in the world. Wow. Yeah, well, that's, that's amazing, because it, it seems like a lot. Um, so, okay, so Adore Desire asks another question. She says, what is actually going on in the towers? Are there any real renovations taking place? Sure. You know, this past summer, we put about $5 million of renovations into the towers. And a lot of those things are things that are what I call behind the walls. So they're not things that everyone can see, touch, and feel, but it's a building <coughs> that I myself lived in um, back in 1991. Um, and so it's an old building. It requires probably about $50 million worth of renovations today to bring it completely um, up to speed. So putting in five million obviously is a drop in the bucket. Uh, one of the things that we are seriously looking at is whether we should privatize the towers and bring an outside firm in, um, have them probably purchase the towers from us and use their capital to renovate the towers completely mm -hmm. um, and then you know uh, we can help manage um, it as a residence life facility uh, but under that private entity. And I think that's something that we have to look at because the capital that's required is capital that we need now and it's not capital we can wait to raise. And given the fiscal circumstances, we have to be innovative about how we fix those problems. Now, to do that type of work all in one summer is also unrealistic, which means that there's the risk of having to shut down one or both buildings. And then that creates the, the conundrum of where do you house those students. <coughs> so these are complicated problems, but mm -hmm. they're problems that we are actively um, trying to get solutions around. And hopefully by January, we would have a decision made around that type of an issue. Okay. So in terms of the towers, where, what exactly was, <coughs> excuse me, what exactly was renovated? What did yeah, so, so we've done a lot of things behind the scenes. We've worked on the age back system. Um, we've recently, uh, as a result again of, of some of the aging and breakdown, uh, we, we had to change um, what we do with respect to IT and the drops um, that were done. Uh, as you know, we changed the entrance. Um, th there were a lot of cracks because of the, the some prior winters on the um, flooring as you walk into the towers. We changed that as well. Um, on <coughs> it, a lot of the rooms uh, required uh, some mold. Um, <coughs> some more de decontamination um, that was done extensively throughout those. We did painting in those areas. We had a lot of uh, walls that needed to be repaired. Those were done as well mm -hmm. um, in the summer. We recently had to replace all the heating system um, as well. We've done that. Um, the water heating as well um, it, you know, is another area that has been done. But by the time you add that up for the number of units you're talking about in board buildings, as I said, $5 million is, is but a drop you know, yeah. in terms of what needs to be done. Yeah, I think it's good that you explain everything that was done because being a student, I hear a lot of students say who live in the towers, um, they may say, I don't know why all the money went to 
the lobby, but my room is still in the condition that it's in. So how do you prioritize what? Yeah, so the, what was spent in the lobby of the five million was <laughs> probably not even a good 2% uh, right. of all the money spent, um, to be quite honest. And then you, you have to remember, I think, a lot of times when we look at our own individual circumstance for our room, despite the best efforts, um, if, if a single unit or mm -hmm. room requires you know, twenty thousand dollars worth of work, and we do, you know, f even if we did five thousand dollars worth of work in that room, which is probably not the case, we probably did maybe twenty five hundred dollars worth of work. To spread that about the entire building, even the things that you do fix um, tend to become marginalized over what overall still needs to be fixed. Um, like I said, it's, it's difficult without capital to do all of that, and two, it's difficult if you decide to shut it down and do it. <coughs> you know, how to do that. And then you have to remember, during the same period of time, part of the strategy was to diversify our revenue stream and to use buildings like Meridian Hill, for instance, for the purposes of trying to bring in a new revenue stream. So just imagine having the towers open at the same time and Meridian Hill, both of which are old buildings that yeah. require a lot of renovations. If we then had to divide the five million between the towers and Meridian Hill, it would be even worse. Now, the strategy is working because we currently do have a contract that we're neg negotiating for Meridian Hill. We will still own um, the, the building, but using a private partnership, we'll be able to convert that into condos and create a revenue stream to the university. So it is working. Everything just unfortunately can't happen All over the once, summer. Right. right. I can't <laughs> sell, I, you know, I, I can't cut a deal for Meridian Hill in the summer, get, you know, 20 something million in, and then turn it around and fix. Right. the towers all at once, all in a three-month period. And, and unfortunately, um, it, while for me uh, and my vision, um, I, I have the months ahead to look at, uh, for the average student, um, it's a transient experience. And, and you're staying in the towers like my staying in the towers um, was a year or two years. And so my explanation that, you know, come back in 2017 and the towers would be great, doesn't help the student who stays in the towers in 2015, 2016, unfortunately. Right. I, you know, when I stayed in it, like I said, it was new. So it was, you know, the high end of all <laughs> of it. But and then moving there from Meridian, you know, I felt like I had moved uptown. To right. be quite honest. <laughs> and now, unfortunately, it, it's been many years that we have to, you know, yeah. restore it to that type of glory. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is from Adore Desire. Can we please have screenings for administrative workers? Your job, she says, your job entails dealing with rude customers sometimes. Um, you shouldn't reciprocate. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that. And, and I assume that what um, that person is asking about is, you know, obviously sometimes people are going to come and yell and scream and, you know, the customer is always right and you, you have to yeah. respond. That is not an innate human behavior. Um, if 10 people come and yell at you, um, after the ninth person, it probably could be frustrating. And the reality is, when you look at the services we provide, the biggest need that students have on this campus is finances. 94% of the students on our campus get financial aid, which means that from a customer service point of view, you're dealing with 9,400 plus people where they're getting financial aid. When you compare that to some of the larger universities, they are probably providing that service to 10 to 30 percent of the people, depending on the circumstance. And some of the universities have large enough endowments that they insulate themselves from the neediest students, right? So at Harvard, if you <coughs> come from a family income of 125,000 and less, th you get a full ride at Harvard, which means mm -hmm. the people who may have the biggest gap in financial aid and, and have the biggest need and have to show up to the office, you've taken them out of the system. We would ultimately like to get there, right? My, my vision and dream is that any Pell Grant eligible student who comes to Howard University gets a full ride. That's ultimately what I would like to see. It, but it means that we ha probably have to provide for less of them. And right now, I think what we're trying to do is to provide for too many students that have need without the, without the, the resources to provide that. And I think that stresses the system. And I think ultimately, it is part of the problem of what happens with customer service. Yeah. So with that being the problem, we have to do a much better job of training the staff, as I think the question, the question is alluding to, to make sure that they provide 
the best customer service regardless of the difficulty of the circumstance. Mm -hmm. And I certainly come from an industry where I understand that. I'm a surgeon, I'm a cancer surgeon at that. I am constantly dealing with patients and families where they probably should have no hope. And to tell people and to grant people hope, as my mentor, Dr. LaFall, always says, is probably the greatest gift that you could give someone, the anticipation of tomorrow. And I think it's the same thing when people come into the office um, here at Howard University for any type of service. You want to be able to provide students with the best service and to provide them with that hope that despite the fact that their financial circumstance is not the best, we're going to have a solution for them. And I think a lot of that then takes away you know, a lot of the negativity. But we have to train the staff. We can't just expect them to develop those high-performing customer service um, skill sets in a very difficult circumstance without right. training. I think that that's, that's been unfair to them, and it's part of my responsibility to fix that. So are the staff, is staff being trained? Uh, absolutely. Right Our human resources um, VP, uh, Carolyn Bostick, who came to us from the, the FAA, is working on launching a, an, a customer service program throughout the entire university. We'll start seeing some of that um, in the spring semester in January, uh, where that type of training will be um, infiltrated throughout the entire campus. But it's not, it cannot be a one-time thing, too. Let me be clear about that. Right. And to make sure that I set the expectations, it has to be something that's ongoing, right? It has, it has, you were just asking me about it's difficult um, running a university. There's no doubt about it. And there's sometimes when, you know, I probably <coughs> close my door and I'm like, I just wish that, you know, some of these problems would go away. But the reality mm -hmm. is they're not going to go away. When I open my door, they're right there. Mm -hmm. I can't express that same frustration um, publicly or, or at every problem. And, you know, only 16 people have done this job prior to me, but I get advice from every single person I met about how to run the university, you know. So all of those things I think you have to take in stride, and we have to, you know, always be at our best in terms of providing customer service. Yeah, and is this like the first, is this the first time something like this is being implemented? Because um, it kind of seems like it's been an ongoing thing for Howard. So is, is this the yeah. first time that... Customer no, I, I, I think it has, um, probably every president has done something to tackle it, right? My predecessor had students first. Um, his predecessor had customer service training, professional development, a leadership academy um, where, where the staff could advance, et cetera. I think everyone has tried to approach it. I think what's different this time is that my recognition of the problem, um, I think, is just a little different. Um, I have seen the problem as a student a faculty member, an administrator. Uh, when I did my MBA in 2009 to 2011, I was a full-time faculty member. Most of the students in my classes had no clue I was an associate dean in a medical school. Mm -hmm. So they freely shared their frustrations and advice with me. So long before people were tweeting about any issue, I was sitting next to students who were describing to me, you know, what doesn't work, what works, et cetera. And I think the customer service thing has to be an ongoing training. That's one thing that's going to be different. Um, about my approach to the problem. And the second um, thing that I think is going to make it diff different is that I recognize the magnitude of the problem and the source of it. And it's not simply that we have, uh, you know, I think people have this um, myth that we have bad employees. Great people work here. Um, but we have to make sure that they are well equipped because we are trying to provide even more customer service with less resources. We're not getting students coming here who are writing checks, you know, for the entire cost of attendance. And, and therefore, we don't have the resources to either provide to them all the bells and whistles that they would like to see. So it's our responsibility to diversify our revenue streams and to take care of that. Um, so so I think looking at the problem a little differently, I'm hoping is part of what would make this solution more durable. Okay, so the next question, we're going to move on. Um, why has there been an increase in the university matriculation fee? Um, Sadia Malcolm, candidate for BA Sociology, class of 2017, asks. Right, again, th that's to put, it, put things in perspective. The tuition, we have a tuition rates and fees committee, uh, which is made up of all of the deans, um, faculty members, staff, and student representatives. And they make the decisions around and, and the suggestions around what the tuition um, should be. As interim president and as president, I have st 
uh, excuse me, stepped in on a couple of occasions, uh, and specifically these last um, couple of years, I've stepped in to suggest that we not touch tuition uh, in terms of raising it, simply because I just don't think the students who come here can afford even the, the cheap tuition that we have relative to the other institutions. We are a university, Morehouse <coughs> College and Spelman College charge more than Howard University does. In the city, as I told you before, the other institutions in the city charge twice what we charge. Mm -hmm. So we clearly are a great bargain, especially when you look at our graduation rate, the fact that we have students from lower income circumstances, et cetera. So with that in mind, we, we have our tuition rates and fees committee, and they decide what the fees should be. And part of how they decide what those should be is they look across um, the spectrum of the other universities, regional, peers, and HBCUs, and they look at what those prices are, and they also look at what we're using the fees for. And with the matriculation fee, when you look at processing um, degrees and, and those types of things, they look at what the cost of that is, and they set the price based on that. And that fee still is the lowest in the region uh, right now. So we still think that, again, we're providing a bargain. Okay. Okay, so the next question is, for majors that traditionally require more than four years, such as pre-med or engineering, why aren't there mandatory equivalent summer bridge programs in place similar to what's in place for pre-med? Tanya Spry, School of Engineering, Class of 92, asks. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to disagree a little bit. Okay. Um, and and I'm, not, I, I, I'm not always one to disagree with students, but I'm going to disagree on this a little bit. I obviously did Howard's BSMD program, two years undergrad, four <coughs> years med school. I am not sure a college education requires four years. I'll, I'll put that on the table. Um, as much as I'm manning an institution right now that requires four years, I'm not sure we, we need that. We have 120 credit hour requirement for all majors at the university now, and that was part of why that came about, recognizing that what are truly the requirements that are needed and how best can we get students to get those requirements so that they spend the least amount of time here and they get out on time, right? And, and I think we have to look at that. So our general education reform that was conducted um, within the past two years was aimed at that. I've said this before publicly. I'm not sure that every student who comes here has to learn to swim, right? We, everybody has a <laughs> swimming requirement. There was yeah. a swimming requirement when I was here as a student, right? <laughs> Um, now, I'll tell you this, I've, looked, I've gone to that swimming class myself, I've, gone, I've looked at other people go to the swimming <laughs> class, and I'm not sure how many of those people really learn to swim, <laughs> right. right? Most of them <laughs> can swim in the shallow, as all of us can, but right. the same people who were fearful of the deep end by the end of the semester are, are fearful still of the scared, deep end, right. and I'm not sure they can save themselves. Now, it came about, th there's a practical reason for it that I don't want to diminish, and that's because African Americans are five times more likely to drown than their Caucasian counterparts, so there clearly is a public safety issue right. um, that Howard University, again, is trying to be at the forefront of addressing. But I'm not sure that's the way to address it, mm -hmm. right? Same thing with um, speech. Uh, we almost all had to take it into yeah. the speech class. Yeah. Well, what, why do we want you to take it into the speech class? What we're really getting at is the competency of being able to articulate your thoughts and ideas in as, as elegant a fashion as possible. You don't need to take a speech class. You, you do that in marketing. You do that in so many other classes you take. What we need to do is to make sure the competency is gained. And so I say all of that to say that some of the requirements now we have been seriously looking at to see what is necessary and to make sure that we're giving you absolutely what you need. Mm -hmm. We don't need to give you too much more than that because we also want you to have a liberal arts education. And that's important because regardless of what field you go into, we want you to have the compassion and the humanity of understanding the world around you to make sure that you yeah. go out and apply what you learn in, in the best way possible. So we can do that more efficiently by looking at those. And I think we're getting better at it. So even in areas like engineering, where the degree requirement at one point probably was almost as high as 145 credits, I think, wow. all of that is now <laughs> significantly down. And we, so I'm not sure bridge programs in the summer is necessary. I think looking at the general education right. requirements and making sure that they're just right is a better way for us to invest money and for that student to pay for the right things um, so they're prepared to finish on time. Yeah. 
Um, I have a kind of a follow up. Are graduation schemes being updated? That's absolutely right. We purchased a software degree works. We now have a graduation scheme from every major um, across the enterprise. Uh, we've beta tested degree works as a software that we purchased so that when you go in to register, it will flag you immediately to let you know if you're on track. If you're not, um, it will direct you to a faculty, uh, an advisor if need be because you may have fallen behind. If you decide you want to take a class because you have a general interest that's not in your scheme, um, as I um, was, was very interested in, I was interested in business and art, et cetera, and I, I wanted to do as many classes as possible. That, yeah. was, that is not practical, and I don't, um, <laughs> I don't advise that. We will, we'll have you sit with an advisor, and you may still have a burning desire to take that economics class, despite the fact that it's not a requirement. And once you engage with the advisor and everybody's clear, we can still keep you on track, then fine. You know, that would be approved. So, so all the graduation schemes are in. Um, all the, the chairs and the faculty have worked on those. Um, you know, and a lot of it is very difficult when you look at the complexity of the general education requirements. But I think we have agreement from all the departments. And th they've been loaded. We've beta tested degree works. And we should be able to launch um, degree works within the, the coming six months. So registration for fall of 2016, I'm hoping, will completely be done through that software. Wow, that's, cool. that's, that's great. So the next question is, is the six credit rule available for seniors graduating in May 2016? Um, if so, can you talk about the rule restrictions, facts, process, et cetera? If it's not available, I would like to know why it has been taken away. Sure, so this, uh, this just to give some background and history, this did not exist. Um, previously, and then um, during my predecessor's administration, um, this was instituted, and that rule was that if you were within six hours um, of uh, six credit hours of graduating, you will would be allowed to walk. You get a cap and gown, etc., and be allowed to walk. Um, again, done with good intentions. Um, the mm -hmm. spirit of it, I think, was the right thing. Like everything else, though, um, you have to examine how effectively it works and what are the ramifications, and it has significant legal ramifications. The students who walk who have six credits left, um, albeit a very, f you know, very, very few of those students, um, decided that, listen, you allow me to walk. The president stood on the stage and granted me my degree. I'm finished. I want my diploma. I'm not coming back to do my six credits. And I think that that violates our academic integrity, plus it puts us in a legal bind. Um, so I made the decision that we would no longer um, have that six hour credit rule. Um, people would have to complete all of their requirements um, before they could walk. So that when I stand on that stage and I say that by the power vested in me, you know, you um, have now graduated, we don't have any loopholes um, or, or any issues around whether or not that person has finished. And we're not tangling with students about whether they will come back and do those six hours or dealing with any lawsuits where people are asking for their diploma and they still have six hours to finish. I think it's, it's an academic integrity issue and one that we, as an institution of higher education, have to stand firmly by. Yeah. And when was the rule taken away? Um, it was taken away two years ago. Okay. Okay. But it was instituted probably two years prior to that. So okay. it was short-lived. but. Yeah. Um, you would swear it was here since 1867. Wow, so that, wow, okay. So uh, the next question is, is the final semester tuition remission system for four-year graduates helping to improve four-year graduation rates? Yeah, it, it would take some time for us to tell that, obviously. We started okay. it last, um, last May, would be the first set of students who would have qualified. Um, so we, we it, it's too early for us to be able to say that. And just to clarify what that is um, for our audience, the students, who graduate on time or before will receive 50% rebate of the direct payments they made in that last semester. So if tuition is 23,000 and you wrote us a check for 23,000, and your, uh, well, your last semester would have been half of that, you wrote us a check for that amount, um, then we would be giving you 50% back of whatever you wrote us that check for as your direct payment. Um, if you were graduating in four years. And I think we have to put the incentives there. We talk a lot in this country about student debt uh, and the, the cost of it, but we as a university pay 40 to 60% of the cost of students who are here in their fifth and sixth year in order to get mm -hmm. them through. 
And it is very difficult for me, as it will be next spring, as it will be every spring that I'm the president, to get a letter or a call from a student that says, you know, Dr. Frederick, I am graduating. I'm the first person in my family to graduate. I have a balance of 5,000. It's been a struggle. This is my sixth year. I get that letter on April 11th. It is difficult to say to that student, you're not going to work. You know, yeah. And so we end up putting up the money to get those students over the line. And I'm not sure that that's the best investment, as opposed to if we had put that money in on the front end in terms of providing that student good resources around academic advising, tutoring, the different support systems that are necessary, and then seeing that, that young man or woman leave yeah. in four years probably would have been a better investment. Well, since you can't tell whether uh, it's improved for your graduation rate since it was recently implemented, um, what kind of response have you been getting? It, we, we get great response. As a matter of fact, um, I, you know, I've, I've now seen President Obama on three different occasions, and on two of those occasions, um, this was part of what we discussed. He is just as anxious as everyone else to, to find out how it works because it's a, it's a different type of solution for what he's been talking about in terms of student yeah. debt. And so I'm excited as well to look at the outcome. And just to be clear, it, it's not something that we're doing in isolation. Right? There are other things that we've done. We've done the Grace Grant, um, where we've afforded sophomore students and higher who are Pell Grant eligible. We've paid off the rest of their balance, uh, again, to increase the, the retention rate. Uh, we've improved academic advising with the formation of the Office of Undergraduate Studies to provide students more support. Um, we've instituted the GUT 15 program through that office to make sure students are taking at least 15 credits a semester. So there's several other things that we have done along the line. So this is not a, a one bullet, um, as it were, um, you know, type of approach. Um, there are several other points of attack that we've taken on to make sure that that works. Okay. Okay, so the next question is, do you support a movement at Howard to make a senior thesis or project a requirement for graduation from the undergraduate schools and colleges? Yeah, I, you know, support is a strong word. I think anything that enhances the academic um, excellence and the academic experience of my students, I support. Now, I'm not sure we need a senior thesis. We, and, I, and the reason for that is our students do more service, I would argue, than any other student body in this country. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be much m closer tied to our culture and tradition if we provided our students with credits for experiential learning, mm. right? So you sat here and interviewed the president today. Um, I think there should be something in it for you as far as credits, right? Based on I what agree. your major is, et cetera. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And I think the, the cumulative if, if impact of, of you doing these types of things should be part of what gets you to graduation because you're doing exactly what it is we ultimately are trying to train you and educate you to be able to do. And these practical experiences um, are experiential learning opportunities, and therefore you should get credit for it. I think that's more in the Howard tradition. The students who participate in alternative spring break, the students who are part of the freshman experience and go to the African burial ground in New York with that group, all of those are things that I think students should get credit for. Yeah. Um, and that would be more in keeping with the Howard tradition, the senior thesis, um, you know, a lot of Ivy League schools use it, and I think we have our own um, Ivy League academic excellence going on here in the form of service, and we should let the world know about it. Hmm. So that kind of actually uh, leads into the next question, which is do you support a service learning component as a requirement for graduation from the undergraduate schools well, and colleges? Well, I think so I answered that. Go. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. Do you support the idea of inaugurating a university-wide peer tutorial system to reduce the university's dropout statistics and improve four-year undergraduate graduation rates? Yeah, my, my short answer is no. To, and, and that's because academic advising, tutoring, that type of support, mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I shouldn't say no in, in a sense of the essence of what the person is asking is not what I'm against. Uh, um, I do think we need to provide more services as, as an administration that supports students getting through the system. But that has to be based on the evidence of what's needed. And the biggest evidence we have of what's needed is that the number one reason students drop out is because of finances. It's not because of academic aptitude. And therefore, if, I will, if 
you gave me a pot of money to apply to what I would do, I would much rather say if you're Pell Grant eligible, you come to school here free. And if you're not, we then help you with some resources as opposed to saying that I would institute any one particular set of services um, to help because I think we would, we would service the largest group of people who actually drop out. The second level tier from that does require some tutorial and a peer tutorial program um, would be something that I do, that, that, that I would support and that I would think would be acceptable. But again, I, it would have to be done in the context of the administrative support that comes with it. And so we would have to, the administration would, would have to supply, you know, the funding for the tutors and those types of things, the environment and really do it, et cetera. Hmm. Okay. So I'm going to move on to alumni. Oh, just kidding. No, I'm not going to do alumni yet. We're going to talk about Howard University Hospital. So why does Howard University Hospital not accept Maryland Medicaid insurance? I do believe that by not accepting these Medicaid patients, Howard University Hospital has lost quite a number of patients. Second, seniors with Medicare, majority of the population who may visit Howard University Hospital, usually have additional coverage Medicaid. So how much is Howard University Hospital losing here in terms of dollars based on one elderly patient? It's yeah, so again, I, I'll challenge that. That's, it's, it's a very specific question. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad <laughs> I'm a physician. I'm not sure I'd be able to answer that otherwise. There are a couple of things in there that, I, that, I, that it's not accurate. One is that w w our, most of our patients do not come from Maryland and they have not for the, for the life of the hospital. If you look at the tradition of where people have lived, the zi you look by zip code in terms of our catchment area, um, that's, that's not an accurate statement. So let, let's mm -hmm. first address that. The, then the small subset of the Maryland Medicaid patient is a very small subset of the population we previously had. And those are some of the lowest payers in the system. Have we lost some patients as a result? We have, and even losing one patient is an issue. I'm not gonna argue with that, but putting it in a bigger context of it from a business circumstance, the commercial insurers we've lost, the patients with commercial insurance, that's the biggest area that we really need to close the gap. We need people who are gainfully employed, who are having elective procedures done. We need them using the hospital just as much as anyone else um, as well. And, and to be clear again about Maryland Medicaid, the reimbursement rates that come from Maryland Medicaid are some of the lowest you can get in any insured um, system. So mm -hmm. for example, if I did uh, a very complex operation and I charged the patient 6,000 and they had Maryland Medicaid versus commercial insurance, I would get probably less than $100 from one and I would get maybe half of what I charged from the other. Wow. And that's an example of the difference. So it, it's, it, that's not accurate. On the last part of the question, which I believe was about Medicare, I think is what I, I, I um, heard you say. Mm -hmm. the, the context of that and the LD patient is what Howard University is about. Uh, and that hospital, to a certain extent, to its detriment, right? Our po the population of patients that come into that hospital, 85% of them have Medicaid or, me or Medicare. And that's one of the reasons why the hospital hasn't thrived. We needed to expand our commercial business so that that ratio is closer to 60% Medicare, Medicaid, and 40% commercial insurance. And that's a big part of what we're doing now. And as we see the census improve, we see admissions improve, we're starting to see more of those elected patients coming into the system. Hmm. You tackled that well, <laughs> doctor. <laughs> okay, so the Cigna plan that Howard University has contracted is one of the worst. If I had a choice, I would opt out. I think as employees, we need to have choices. I would rather pay a little more for a premium, but be happy with the, um, with the coverage of choice. Right, and, and, and I understand um, that, that issue. And this issue here is that we um, are contracted with Cigna to provide health insurance for our employees. It is very difficult to provide more than one option for the employee base that we have, right? What we pay in terms of the employer part of the premium is really predicated on how many overall patients or employees we bring to that particular plan, right? So I roughly have about 5,000 employees. 
Um, so if I say to Cigna or to Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or any other insurer, Aetna, I am going to give you 1,000 of my 5,000, and I do that for five insurers, the premium that they will charge me for each now goes up. And it could go up significantly because instead of getting 5,000 people, they're getting 1,000. Mm -hmm. right? And then depending on who in that, who in the 5,000 picks any one, if all my elderly patients pick Blue Cross Blue Shield, the, my elder, I should say my elderly faculty and staff, then the premium is even higher. So it's a very complicated circumstance. When we were negotiating this, we had a wide variety uh, representation from the campus to look at all of the proposals that were placed. So this, again, was not just Dr. Frederick decided we're going to go with Cigna. We had all the insurers come in, they gave their proposal. We had people from the faculty and staff and retirees all involved in trying to help us decide which one. And the recommendation I got from them was that we should use Cigna. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna, we're, now we're gonna move on to alumni. <laughs> okay, so how can alumni help you reach your goals for the university? It, uh, alumni are key. They are a, a major part of um, the anchoring system that yeah. must help us um, you know, really grow from a foundation point of view. And the primary thing I, I need for my alumni is engagement. Um, obviously, we want them giving, but I want them giving because they understand what we're doing. And that engagement is key. And I think when you have complete and total alumni engagement, it allows you to do all the things that you need to do. So homecoming is an example. Uh, we have open houses on the Friday. I give a State of the University address to the alum. As much as my alum, um, there's nothing like an HU party, and they come to homecoming and have a good time, I want them to come on campus, go into the classroom, go meet the dean. We've created a circumstance for them to do that. I've created a State of the University address for them to come and hear about the university. So they need to be engaged. And that's the, the number one thing that they can do to help me to understand my vision, um, to look at these webcasts so that they can understand you know, wh where we're going. Because there's no one address can I answer every single question that they may have. But that mm -hmm. repeated engagement, the repeated venues that they can hear from me and also hear from my faculty and students um, gives them a better opportunity to understand what we're doing and, and to get involved and to lend their talents to that effort. Yeah. So what trends are we seeing with alumni engagement? Is it growing? Or? It, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I've got to tell you, uh, for years I think um, people have berated our alum and I'm happy to say that in my first year alumni participation in giving is up 47%. Wow. Um, so we've had more alum um, donating than ever before. That's number one. Number two, our pa that participation rate is now above the national average for the first time in about a decade. Again, um, showing that they are involved, engaged, and they have stepped up to the plate. So I'm very, very pleased um, you know, with, with the involvement. We're still a long ways away from where we want to be. But um, it, you know, if you're looking at how they've started the marathon, they've started strong. Yeah. OK. Um, so how successful are your alum outreach goals? And how do you plan to inform students and alum about the importance of giving back to Howard? Well, I, you know, I talk about it all the time. I've now been to almost 20 cities um, around the world talking to alum as far as London, um, Trinidad, Jamaica, outside of the country. Um, I've been to several states in the US, several cities in the US. And, and there are more on my calendar um, coming up. So we, we are out there talking to them, reaching out to them about what, what they need to do. And my goals are to get and to try to touch every single living alum by some mechanism. So one is obviously those appearances in person. Um, I put out a Bison Beat newsletter every month. Um, and, and again, that's targeted at the entire Howard community. We do these presidential webcasts. Part of it is to reach alum. Uh, we, we, I'm doing a City to the University address um, during homecoming. Um, I've done, what I, I do two for the faculty. Um, the students have engaged me around doing one directed at them, um, to, which I've agreed to do. So we're doing everything possible to get the message out in terms of outreach and to make sure as well the students know. As part of orientation, we have to start talking about alumni giving as well. So when students come in, they recognize that one of our expectations is that return on investment. So I had the opportunity to meet with the freshman scholars the other day, 
And one of the things I spoke about was the fact that we're looking for that return on investment. One, that they go out and they're excellent at what they do, but they have to look back to the university and give back. And that's something that we expect. Um, we're going to use students um, to make phone calls to try to raise mm -hmm. funds. I think that's another way to get students engaged in the process so they understand the process and they can participate in it as well. So we're, we're active on several fronts um, to make sure that everybody understands that giving has to be a very significant part of what's going to drive the university. And that's what the data currently is suggesting in higher education. Yeah. And what do you think? So do you think it's that engagement that is um, heightening the give back rate? I, I think so. I, I think that engagement is heightening it. I mean, Giving Tuesday um, was this week. Um, last year we did it uh, for the first time. We had roughly over 300 donors. Um, this year we had over 600 donors. I think that's a classic example of the engagement. Um, I do the daily drum on the re on WHUR uh, once a month. I think I'm on there next Tuesday um, evening. I have my own radio show that comes on the journey for 15 minutes every Sunday after um, chapel. So again, I, you know, I think there's a lot of, and I, and I mentioned those because I get a lot of feedback from people who are listening, mm -hmm. who are tuning in on a regular basis. And I think, again, they're getting more and more information about what they can do. Yeah. So I did a story actually not too long ago for the Howard University News Service. And um, it was centered around the Take Back HU movement and alum the alumni factor. So when I was doing the story, I spoke with quite a few alumni, and some of them expressed that a lot of the things that they went through were things that were stu current students were going through as they saw on through the movement on Twitter, on social media. Do you think that has anything to do with the alumni give back? I, you know, I, I, I hear that a lot, um, and I have to accept that because that's what people say. Um, I don't fully accept it. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, I, I can't say that I fully embrace that notion. And that's because I am a triple alum of this university. Um, I came here, I stood in a line that I have never seen the front or end of anywhere I've ever been in any other circumstance to get registered, uh, to get my picture ID, et cetera. And I am telling you, that and the frustration that came along with that would never be a reason why I would not give back to this place that has now allowed me the opportunity to have three degrees and to practice the, in the best profession ever, which is medicine. Mm -hmm. So I, I, can't, I can't say that that is the singular reason. Um, it may be a factor, but it's not an insurmountable factor. Yeah. And I would also argue that even if that was the concern, then giving back to ensure that someone else doesn't have to stand in that line should be the approach. Yeah. And I would make that argument strongly. So it is a factor, but I don't think it's an insurmountable factor. Okay, in like 20 seconds, if you could say anything to the student body, what would you tell them right now? You know, I, I think we have the best student body um, in the world. We have a tough circumstance here at the university, but we have one that we think we have the best solutions for. So I, w I need them to hang in there with me. I need them to give me the feedback. I want the tone and tenor of that feedback to be the best of them, and I think we're going to get it done. Thank you. Thank you, President Frederick. Um, okay, so this is the end. That went by really fast. So we've come to the conclusion of our time. Um, so we'll have to end it here. For additional questions and or comments, you can reach out to Dr. Frederick through Facebook using uh, Wayne A.I. Frederick or on Twitter at HUPrez17. Dr. Frederick, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here with you today, as well as for your insights. And thanks to Howard University and friends for watching and participating with us. I'm Erin Winters, and thanks for watching.